Welcome to Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation possible. You will get to hear from CSIA system integrators and industry partners to get a better understanding of how they help their clients solve process challenges and how they've earned success in their careers. Along the way, we will touch on system integration best practices, technology, trends, and challenges. Whether you are a manufacturer, end user, supplier, or system integrator, you will enjoy the insights these industry professionals bring to this podcast. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Lisa Richter, the host of Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation and processing possible. In today's episode, we're continuing our conversation with Teresa Benson, who is a product storyteller and strategist with over 20 years of experience in high tech. Part one of this conversation is available in episode 80. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Speaking a little bit more broadly then and looking at the industry, what trends and challenges are you seeing in industrial automation right now? There's a lot of interesting stuff happening in industrial automation. And like I said earlier, this sort of confluence of human and machine, when I was deep in IA stuff, you know, it was industry 4.0, data, 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 get the data out. You'll be able to do preventive maintenance and all this other stuff. And people weren't really talking about how you had to understand the data in order to understand how to implement a preventive maintenance program based on just sheaths and sheaths of data out of sensors and controllers and whatever. What I see now is, of course, the big guys with, you know, Siemens and their synth AI or ThingWorks, you know, Rockwell and PTC. It's not just them, but I'm seeing smaller AI and machine learning companies in the manufacturing space who are helping businesses truly operationalize all that data. For so long, it was gather, 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 and then good luck, or gather, 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 and get an engineer who could write a good program. And what I'm seeing now is that there's this new wave of machine learning that's, again, enabling people who aren't necessarily data scientists to be able to use it in a practical way to improve their operations. And so I think that's great. I think the challenges still remain certainly skilled labor. When I say citizen data scientists, you still need to know enough to know whether or not the answers that a model is giving you are valid. So you definitely still need to be skilled. And so those are still challenges, of course. But I really am hopeful for the industrial automation community adopting data science in a much more meaningful way. I mean, they're already using it for forecasting and that sort of thing, but AI enables cybersecurity. It's not really enough anymore to just have good hardware protecting your operational networks, but having AI enabled threat detection, being able to monitor machine behavior and communication on networks, and then having something know that the data that's being transferred right now is not normal at this time of day or whatever, and being able to do something about it in real time is incredibly powerful. The threats are only going to increase in terms of network attacks. I think I read a statistic, something like 80% of telecom 79% of customer goods manufacturers are using some sort of AI-enabled cybersecurity at this point. So I'm excited to see where that goes in industrial automation hardware providers providing more cybersecurity type technology with AI. What makes you optimistic about the future of the automation industry? Oh, there's so much to be optimistic about. I think probably the biggest thing is this idea of the human in the loop. The fact that People are realizing that by leveraging both human intuition, intelligence, experience, 
and the speed and accuracy of automation, by leveraging both of those, you can do more than you could do with either on their own. Gives me a lot of optimism for the future that people are seeing the benefit of sort of the co-manufacturing model. There's cobots, of course, but I'm talking even bigger than that. I think that is something that's super exciting. I think synthetic data is a really fascinating area of industrial automation. I mean, it's everywhere, but in industrial automation in particular, imagine if you could build models of what good looks like before you've even run your first pilot down a new production line. So you use image AI to inspect for quality control, right? And you've got your CAD model, which you know is what perfect looks like. But there is this whole arena of what's called synthetic data, where you can build these machine learning models that your inspection equipment can then leverage to detect defects. And it's great for predictive maintenance applications as well, where you don't have a lot of data on how a machine might fail at this particular plant. And so augmenting the data you do have with additional data so that you can build your predictive maintenance models and do all of those, there's so much interesting stuff happening. And then the whole fact that you can start to empower the people who are on your production lines to be a part of this innovation, I think will be really good. Just that knowledge of when that machine makes that sound that way, I know that something bad's going to happen. Being able to codify that, I think it's all really valuable. I think I'm really excited for this, bringing the human back into the loop. What mistake did you make and what did you learn from it? Going back to something that I said earlier about the decision I made to leave the company that I was at, I think the mistake I made was really trying to just bear down and get through 2021. And I didn't really notice it until I had had the opportunity to live and work in Sweden for about a month in February of 2022. Being away from everything that had gone on and I was over there We had acquired a company and I was sort of building bridges between the parent company and the company we had acquired. Coming back from that experience is when it really hit me just how much loss had happened. And I found myself just not giving everything like I had before. And I found myself almost snapping at coworkers. And I get it. All of us do that occasionally, right? But it just felt crunchy. I don't know how else to describe it. And so I think the mistake for me was not raising my hand sooner and saying, I can't keep going. I really need to process the stuff that's going on. I really need to figure it out and then come back. And I get that my experience is unique, And that I'm incredibly fortunate to have been able to step back for a moment and just check in. I know that isn't a luxury for everyone, but I am so glad I did. But I wish I had done it sooner. While the solutions to every challenge facing the industry today are not always clear, one thing is certain. A successful business must be bold as it tackles these changing times head on. The CSIA 2023 Executive Conference is just the place to be to explore these changes, opportunities, and solutions. With a carefully curated educational agenda, formal and informal networking opportunities, and an expo to showcase the latest innovations, the conference is built to bring you the resources you need to succeed. Plus, this year's CSIA is putting extra emphasis on bringing you four highly rated keynote speakers to ensure you walk away with actionable advice, thought-provoking ideas, and an energized attitude. And best of all, you'll do it in the iconic city of New Orleans. For more information, visit www.controlsys.org slash conference 2023. C 
see you May 15th to the 19th in the Big Easy. What are you excited about for yourself personally going forward? One thing that I'm working on at the moment, and it's all because I'm a total nerd, is my local library has a maker space. They've got 3D printers, laser engraver. I mean, they've got everything, but they were donated a long arm quilting machine. And before people tune out because quilting, what? It's actually very high tech. You know, it uses a ton of accelerators and all kinds of stuff to make it work. And it's very precise, but they were having trouble getting the machine to work. And they'd had it for months. And I would wander by every once in a while and I didn't see anybody using it. And so one day I went in and I said, do you mind if you give me the manual and don't bother me for a couple hours and I'm going to figure this thing out? So I did. And it was a blast. So then I was able to teach the staff. And in teaching the staff, they actually invited me to participate in something that is just so deeply meaningful. For Black History Month, we're inviting the community to come in and learn about the history of quilting in America and especially among, you know, enslaved people and some of the sort of industrial automation inventions in Black history that apply to sewing and quilting. And so I'm going to be an instructor over the course of February, working with the community, people who have maybe never sewn before. And we're going to put together a quilt that will unveil on Juneteenth. So I'm just awed and feel so privileged to be asked to help with this really important project. So there's that. I also have recently gotten a couple of clients who are doing just super cool stuff. My NDAs don't allow me to talk much about it, but, uh, you know, doing video production for them or, you know, just really sitting and listening with them and helping them map out an approach that'll be achievable has been really exciting. And then I have a quilt show coming up in May. I'm going to be displaying some work that I've done. I think a lot of people underestimate what's available at a lot of libraries. There's one near me in in a nearby community in Skokie. Oh my goodness. They have a recording studio with equipment. Yes. Yes. It's amazing. I realize these are, you know, wealthier communities probably, but I think people underestimate, you know, they just think that it's crusty old books, but it's not. It's not. I mean, the amount of additive manufacturing type stuff at the library near me is unbelievable. I mean, every time I've been in there for a meeting with the staff or when I was trying to figure out the equipment there, those 3D printers were just constantly going. It's not our parents' library. No. By any means, you know? Mm -mm. Yeah. And the amount of equipment that you can check out. Like my local library, there's a whole section that's not books. It's literal hardware that you can check out just like you would check out a book to do all number of things. You know, there's CNC equipment that you can use. I mean, it's really cool. If you had to choose a completely different career, and this is where I would say I would totally want to be a librarian if I could. I've said that before, but It's just such an exciting place to be, I think. Mm -hmm. It's just a room full of things you can learn and discover. And I mean, seriously, if the zombie apocalypse happens, I hope I can make it to a library. And that's where (laughs) I'm going to pull up there. But it's not speaking of me, but speaking of you, what career would you choose? I knew you were going to ask me this question. (laughs) I, um, I honestly think I am now on the precipice of doing it. I thoroughly enjoy helping people, educating people. You mentioned in the opening, I literally had somebody call me corporate spackle, you know, that I come in and fill in the gaps and sort of smooth things out and figure out what's what. So to be able to do that and also be able to do things like educate my community or give back in some way, while also building strategies, helping people figure out their message for their product or their brand or doing videography. It tickles my brain in so many ways. You know, just before I got on the podcast, in fact, I was working on some JavaScript and I had 
postman open and I was trying to get an API call working and whatever, because, you know, I'm working on something for a client. And then here I am talking about quilting. I don't know. It's, I think I'm finally hitting that. But if you made me, made me pick, it would be some sort of thing in education, not necessarily a school, but educating, helping. Yeah. What's the best advice you could give your younger self just getting started? Gosh, don't be so afraid to make mistakes. You know, done is better than perfect. For people who might know the show Adventure Time, one of the guys says in that the first step to being good at something is really sucking at it. (laughs) So it's okay if you don't know stuff, you know. I wish I had started quilting sooner because, oh my gosh, it's... I had a customer tell me years ago to pick a hobby with a beginning, middle, and end because you'll never get that satisfaction in your work life. You'll always have the next project going before the last one's finished. And I'm so grateful for that advice. The other thing is, you know, you don't promote Michael Jordan to coach. It's really okay once you find your groove to keep doing that thing. Not everybody has to aspire. There's so much we can learn from team sports about everybody has a role to play and just pay the people who are excellent at what they do their worth. Corporations have made these like salary bands at different levels. And, you know, the higher in the org chart, the bigger you're. And it's like, no, no, no. Hey, Michael Jordan, a heck of a lot of stuff to keep doing the thing he does really well, really well. You know, he shouldn't have to be promoted to coach in order to get a significant bump. Well, and that's probably a bad example because he does make a lot of money. Or he did. Well, yeah, let's yeah. Say, but, but that's what I mean <laughs> yeah, is, yeah, is yeah. I would love to see that happen for individual contributors and frontline workers and, you know, middle management. Like that's something that I worked really hard when I have managed people to develop them. And those that wanted to stay, encourage them to be the best at what they wanted to be at the level they were at. And for those that wanted to pursue something else higher in the organization, by all means, give them the support to do it. But so often, I think people think that developing their employees means developing them for a role higher on an org chart. And just because somebody is higher on an org chart doesn't necessarily mean that they have that much greater value. No offense to anybody that I worked for previously, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, or that that person would be happy, right? Yeah, They're, exactly. You know, maybe they don't want the stress or they won't, don't want all that change or, you know, that's just exactly. not a good fit for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reason why someone is good at the job that they're doing doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be great as a manager, enjoy it, want it. And our compensation structures need to evolve to enable corporations to continue to incentivize people who are really good at what they do to keep doing what they do. I love that. I have one last question, and that is, what are your recommendations for three books or podcasts that you're listening or enjoying right now? When I wrote this, I didn't know about a fourth one. I took some notes before our podcast today. I think you recommended If Books Could Kill. Yeah. I am obsessed with that (laughs) one now. But uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is just phenomenal and hilarious. My Favorite Murder. I am a stereotypical American woman listening to murder podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's char- good. Those hosts are charming though. And they, they, they really seem are. like they get along really well. So it's fun to listen to them. Absolutely. And then in terms of books, I'm reading this one called Yesterday. It's by uh, an author named Felicia Yap. And it is fascinating. It's about a world in which you either remember one day back or two days back. So you're either a mono or a duo. And you have to use technology in order to learn certain facts, you know, about like who you're married to. Where did you meet them? (laughs) You know, like all of these different things. And from birth until either age 18 or 23, it's 18 for monos, 23 for duos. You have full memory, but then when you turn that age, your brain no longer makes long-term memories. And so 
It's fascinating. I'm right in the middle of it right now. And I love how they've reimagined the world. Apple, instead of an iPhone or whatever, they introduced the iDiary, you know, and (laughs) yeah, it's really good. And then anything by Anthony Horowitz, he's a writer who's written for television. There's a few BBC shows that he's written, but he's written these books very much in like a Sherlock Holmes, Agatha Christie style. I would read anything he wrote, honestly. I'm sensing a theme here, a murder theme. (laughs) I know. It's kind of terrible, isn't it? Maybe maybe I need to go question a few things. Yeah, I'm a little old lady sitting there quilting, listening to all the curious ways that people die. (laughs) I love it. It's all right by me. (laughs) Well, that's it for today's episode of Talking Industrial Automation. If you're interested in learning more about Teresa, you can find her on LinkedIn. That's Benson with an O, not an E, or her website, radiantmeatball.com. Thanks for listening. And thank you, Teresa, for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also help others find us by leaving a five-star review and sharing your favorite episodes with colleagues. Thanks for listening to the Talking Industrial Automation Podcast. Thanks also to bensound.com and Wistia for the music bumpers. Until next time.